<clears throat> Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Once again, what a great privilege uh, in this crazy world that we're going through, all of us right now. Um, <clears throat> uh, we get to sit and listen to how the Holy Spirit touched someone's heart and drew them to a deeper walk with Jesus Christ. And then surprisingly, home to the Catholic Church. Our guest tonight is um, we were at the same seminary together at different times, though we, we missed each other. And we need to hear more about that. Right. Former Lutheran and Congregationalist. He's now a professor of ancient history at Hillsdale College, Dr. Kenneth Calvert. Marcus, Dr. Good, to, Calvert. good to be here. Thank it you is, for having me. Yeah, It's great. To, Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, we just miss each other a year at I seminary. I think it's just a couple of years, right? Right. But we we, we both played uh, basketball in, in, in the same gym. At, so, <laughs> I mean, who cares about the teachers? We right, were in the right. same gym together. Oh, there were teachers at the seminary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh wonderful to be here with you. Well, it's good to have you here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, if you've seen the program, you know that I my job now is to kind of sit back and not talk and encourage you to start us off on your journey way oh, back good. when. Right. Well, actually, I'm going to start uh, in the near term. Okay. Um, and it was in uh, 2016 that my eldest son, Joel, uh, came into the church. And he uh, he first told his mother because his mother, he thought, would be much more uh, you know gracious about all of this, and then told me. And actually, I had no problem with it at all. In fact, at the Easter vigil when he was coming into the church, I was sitting there thinking to myself, why am I not doing this? Huh. You know, uh, a year later, 2017, my dear daughter, Claire, uh, entered into the church. And it was at that time that um, uh, Beth, uh, my wife, said, I can't not do this anymore. Wow. And so I want to start there and then kind of go back and, and come forward uh, and share with you, you know, some of my story and then a little bit of the family story too. Well, yeah. Because, and this is good, yeah. because I, I had planned to ask you a question. Okay. And I won't ask it now. I'll tell All you right. what I'm going to ask and later we'll get to it. Okay. You know, John Henry Cardinal Newman makes that statement in, in the introduction to the essay in Development of Doctrine. Um, to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Yes. Yeah. And I had that quoted to me so many times. And I, as, as a Protestant theologian, as a Protestant uh, thinker, I, I, was, I was fighting that every step of the way. <laughs> and that's my question is yeah, yeah. that you and I both know lots of non-Catholic historians that right. are very deep in history. Yeah, right. But they're not Right. So we'll get yeah. to that. Yeah, we'll get back to that. And that's He's, a great question. We'll, we'll, yeah. So as, as, as a young man, um, we never didn't go to church. We were always in church. My father, uh, he, was, he was a difficult guy, had been through the, the Great Depression and World War II. He was an infantryman under Patton. Um, wow. not, a, not an easy man to get along with, but you know what? He always had us in church. Uh, we had some difficulties in the family, but in the end, we were always there. And faith and, and the presence of Christ in our family was, was crucial. It, it really, that mercy was really important in our family you life. Know, you know, yeah. recently when I've been watching some of the, the documentaries on the war, and thinking what your dad went through, yeah. you can understand there's yeah. a lot inside of him. Yeah, and he was, he was just a through. young man. He was 19 years old <laughs> when he was doing this, you know? Amazing. That generation, really, really a remarkable group of people. Yeah. yeah. So. And so um, I, uh, we moved around a great deal, but eventually I went to Wheaton College uh, for my undergraduate. And what was your upbringing? What, any particular oh, Actually, actually um, uh, evangelical broadly, but mostly Methodist. Uh, we would attend all kinds of kind of Pentecostal churches and things like that, but mostly Methodist. That's what I recall okay. as being the main, you know, part of it. At Wheaton, um, came across a guy named Bob Weber who wrote a book called Evangelicals on the Canterbury Trail, right? And that kind of drew me into the Church of England and the Episcopal Church and into liturgy and a higher understanding of the meal. And I see that as an important step. Um, Bob Weber was very popular among the students at Wheaton, and a number of us began to attend the Episcopal Church. And I was Episcopalian, and I would say Church of England for, for quite some time. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny, as much as long as I've known about Wheaton because of yeah. my own evangelical, back, yeah. evangelical background, I never went there. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, was 
was the introduction into the Anglican Episcopalian experience a bit of a controversy at first at Wheaton? It was. You know, Bob Weber was seen as kind of the, you know, edgy, you know, uh, mm -hmm. radical type on, on the edge of, and this was back in the early 80s. I mean, that's a uh, bit too Catholic for the Wheaton yeah, Angelicals. Yeah, it was, it was. Because I know they had a hard time with Billy Graham when he was so open to Catholics. Right, that's right. And we had, we had, a, we had a, um, a, a Catholic priest who would come and spend time on the campus at Wheaton not to evangelize or anything. He just wanted to get to know evangelicals. Yeah. And I used to have lunch with him every once in a while. And he, he just came to mind actually a few days ago, and I can't even remember the man's name, but very interesting conversations with him. Um, went off to Gordon-Conwell Seminary uh, to because I thought I was called to the to the ministry, to the pastorate. Now, I'm interrupting. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Because I want to ask a question. Yeah. Methodist, Wheaton, Gordon-Conwell. Right. Had you met Jesus? Yes, I would say as a young man around the fifth grade. Okay. In those days, we were living in Hayes, Kansas. And um, I had a wonderful teacher at school, fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Johnson, who went to the same Methodist church that we attended. Okay. And it was at that point where I really you know, felt drawn into the faith. So the, it was the commitment to Christ that's all along, Absolutely. all the way to Gordon yeah, Conwell. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. important. I, yeah, yeah, and that, that is important too. And and again, you know, Marcus, I don't, I don't turn my back on my Protestant years. I don't repudiate those years. You know, this is all important work that the Holy Spirit is doing all along the way. And that to me is... is, well, is brought you to Christ. Right, exactly. Exactly. Brought me to Christ. And at, at Gordon-Conwell, um, uh, attended uh, Episcopal Church, same place where Thomas Howard, yeah. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, his sister, was attending, you know. And um, again, being drawn more and more into uh, the liturgy and to, to, to the beauty of the liturgy and again, to a higher understanding of the Eucharist, right? Now, along the way, in 1984, I first read the book or the work by St. Athanasius mm -hmm. on the Incarnation, you know, written in the 4th century AD. And I was so taken with his argument regarding mm -hmm. the Incarnation, that God would become man, that um, it, it just became yeah. almost an obsession, for me, you know, and, and I was wondering, where is this best understood? And for a while, I, I was convinced it was the Episcopal Church. I, I went to Engl England, lived in England, worked for a year there for the Church of England, got to know the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, um, and, you know, felt kind of at home there, but there was always, you know, a little bit of something missing. I studied in Rome in 1989, and I went with the Church of England to Rome. And I think that uh, we had mass with John Paul II. And John Paul came by, he was within two feet, says, hi, you know, and I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I don't think I really understood what was going on in those <laughs> days. But um, we had a, a, a professor there at the Vatican who, I'll be honest with you, Marcus, held to nothing that anyone would construe as orthodox. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, at that moment, I, I probably could have been drawn into the church, except there was this professor. And it was, it was, it was more than a little disappointing to me, because I had thought of the Catholic Church as something more of a, of a vessel carrying orthodoxy, even though I didn't at that time understand the Eucharist, I didn't understand Mary, papal authority, that kind of thing. I didn't understand that. But I had kind of hoped for yeah. more from this guy. You know, I'd kind of heard some evangelicals say at some point something to the effect that we have no interest in becoming Catholic, but I don't know what we'd do if the Catholic Church ever failed. Right. Because there's right. something about yeah. the trustworthiness right. of this church that forms a foundation for what right. they were. Right. Absolutely. There's so much within evangelicalism and within Protestantism in general. It's either reacting to, trying to argue against, or kind of depending upon the Catholic Church for setting a certain tone. How can we say we are not Christian if we don't affirm Nicaea, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chalcedon, 
you know, the creeds of the church. I mean, you were Episcopalian, so I mean, that yeah. even that statement itself kind of shouts in the face of the sola scriptura folk. Exactly. Because sola scriptura folk are going to hold to right. Nicaea. Right, right. That's exactly right. And, and, and there too, I... You know, the, the, the Council of Nicaea and the language of homoousius, you know, the language of, of God, Father and Son being one, and that this is the person who came into the world, radically came into the world, God as material substance. You know, it's all there. And, and even as an Episcopalian, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, this is, you know, this is a statement drawn from the, the, the Gospel of John that really en encapsulates all that we are as Christians, mm -hmm. right? And so that was all there. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm raising my fist against, you know, the Catholic Church and salvation by works and worship of the saints, you know, and all of that kind of thing. And I have, I have so many friends, Marcus, who've been so very, very patient with me over the years, so many Catholic friends. Um, one of my good friends, uh, Tracy Simmons out in Virginia, had just, you know, very, very patient with Calvert and all the stupid things he would say, you know, and uh, Brad Burtzer up at Hillsdale, just some good men. But, you know, they were constantly feeding me uh, the things I needed to know, and constantly responding with grace and love. And uh, I had a chance to attend Harvard and spend some time at Oxford. And honestly, through that whole time, what is it that kept me Christian in the faith was the incarnation, hmm. that God had become man. And all of our intellectual arguments against truth you, you can't deny the fact that God has become man, you know. And, and, and Beth and I, my wife and I, were, were invited to go with Hillsdale College students. I'm a professor at Hillsdale College. We, we were invited to go to Israel. And this came up about two weeks before the trip. Our provost said to me, I can't go. Can you go? An ancient historian going to Israel? Are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> it was wonderful. And so I said, of course. I would go, and little did I know, and this was after Joel became Catholic, this was after Claire became Catholic, this is when Beth was really starting to be drawn in. Um, we went to the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth, hmm. and there, you know, the, the, the Latin, the translation, you know, it's, it, here the Word was made flesh, here the Word was made flesh. You know, and in the Gospel of John, the world was made flesh and dwelt among us. But at that church, here. <laughs> so someplace on earth, geographically located, in time and place, here the Word was made flesh. And that, you know, the whole idea of the Incarnation, it just came flooding over me. I, was, I burst into tears. I had to go to a different part of the church and just kind of hide myself. And that was um, the moment when uh, I agreed with Beth, I can't not do this. And, you know, I'd given her a hard time for wanting to become Catholic. That, that woman was very, very patient with me. <laughs> um, and, and yet, uh, you know, um, at that moment, I just, I could not deny it any longer. And so, yeah, came into the church Pentecost of... Uh, 2018, uh, and she at Easter a few weeks before. And then our youngest son, uh, Ian, came along. We dragged him along. And uh, that's when our, we completed what our deacon, one of our deacons called the Calvert Invasion of St. Anthony of Padua. <laughs> <laughs> so. our, our guest is Dr. Kenneth Calvert. Um, you know, you think about those essential dogmas that make all the difference. Mm -hmm. um, that if you don't accept, everything else falls apart. Mm -hmm. One of them for me is God is creator. Right. If you don't right. get that, right. everything else falls apart. Right. Everything else falls apart. Yeah. You know, everything we see in the world around us, everything mm -hmm. we understand, God is creator. Then everything from that starts making sense. He is risen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there it is. If, right. if you're having the worst 
possible doubts and everything is gone. Yeah. He is risen. He is risen. Okay. Right. But the incarnation, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's the, 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 the pivot. Right. On all of history. Right. And it helps one understand who is Mary. She's in Genesis, she's in Revelation, and all along the way. And when, when she comes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, you know, why should the mother of my Lord come to visit? The mother of my Lord. I've, I've heard that story a thousand times as a Protestant. But now, as a Catholic, I think Mary was the tabernacle. She carried God for nine months. His DNA is her DNA, right? And all of a sudden, Mary takes on this amazing new scope that she had not before. And I thought as a Protestant, I kind of understood who Mary was. Now I know, mm. right? Um, the Eucharist and the real presence of the meal. Um, how the incarnation, that is the incarnation, reminding us every single time we take the meal that he is really, truly present with us. The church itself, we are the body of Christ, right? Uh, ministering to one another and there too. We are incarnational. We're part of this whole story. And, and the leadership of the church, you know, there, there are so many things. You know, Marcus, I, I wonder whether or not I was actually reading the Bible hmm. before I was Catholic. And there's so many authors, uh, ancient authors, modern authors, Knox, Newman, Chesterton, um, Fulton Sheen, you know, his work, uh, the, the Mystical Body of Christ, you know, that is all incarnational. I wonder, Marcus, what in the world I've been reading all these years? Because over the last two years or so as a Catholic, it's this, this whole new world has opened up to me. And, you know, uh, just, just so many authors, whether it's Flannery or Connor or, or whoever, just a whole new sense of understanding um, what these people are writing about. And when, what do they write about most often? You know, Benedict and John Paul, the incarnation and the presence of Christ in a real way on earth, in time, in history. Imagine... Uh... The old day when the movie theaters, you know, would have a camera up and back with the with the film going yeah. through, and the guy sitting up there, half the time paying attention, you know. Right. So they show in this brand new movie that you want to get there, but you're late. So they start the movie and it's going, but before you get there, accidentally a green um, filter fell in front of the lens. Yeah, yeah. And then you show up. Right. Well, the people that have been there know there's something wrong, but you don't. Right. That's right. So you're watching the film through this. And you're, this is weird. I, what, what's wrong with this thing? I, 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 I'm, I've had. I'm leaving. So you leave, and then after you leave, oh, the guy fixes it. The people that've been there the whole time, they, they see know it. it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But if you don't see the whole picture, you right. just you might right. see it skewed. Right. Right. And you know, it's interesting too. There's there's another angle to this. Um, Catholics who've been Catholic from birth. I've had, I've had people say, why would you convert? Mm. You know, or I'll say to them, you know, the incarnation, do you understand what this is all about? And I think, I didn't know that, <laughs> you know? And so it, it was, it, it's, it's like two, maybe if we reverse that, 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 that image, yeah. all of a sudden being able to bring some clarity yeah. to folks who had been, you know, cradle Catholics. Um, I, I meet with a group of men on Saturday mornings, and last week one of our guys said, wow, the tears, you have tears in your eyes talking about your conversion. He said, this makes me love Catholicism, love my faith more. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, and this is why I think your, your, your program yep. is so important. You know, how much it brings into the life of the church, these, these various stories. Well, his mother once said about the journey home a long time ago, she said it, it, it helps Catholics um, appreciate what they've too often taken for granted. Right, right. 
and it's and e it's a easy. lot of EW10 does that. But I mean, yeah. you know, really, that's what yeah. we are to appreciate the, right. the, the gifts that we have that right. we we take for granted. And that's that's the great ministry of this of this show, and of what EWTN does, and the the popularity of it shows the hunger, the hunger that's out there. But Ken, you had it all for so long, and you were just dang stubborn. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, stubbornness is, is exactly right. And, 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 you know, I think that there was stubbornness, there was pride. Um, there was also wanting to, you know, not wanting to, to, to acknowledge I was wrong, but I had a lot of friends who were Protestant and a lot of yeah. professors who I respected deeply who were Protestant. And, I, you know, I, I, I think to myself, how can they not be Catholic? You know, I, you know, now I think about that. You know, we, we talk about sola scriptura. I said this to a group of students recently. If you really believe that scripture is true and you really want to take it seriously, look at the Catholic Church. Now, we don't believe in sola scriptura, but there is not a single aspect of the Catholic Church that is not informed in some way by scripture and so often, a very literal interpretation of Scripture. This is my body. This is my blood. The Scripture takes oh. that seriously. St. Paul takes that seriously. If you don't understand it, you're taking this meal unworthily, right? Well, what, what, what worries me then, what bothers me then, <laughs> is, is if we only see the meal as figurative, as not literal, then we are really not only doing damage to our understanding of the Eucharist, but to ourselves as well. And that is uh, that comes from a, a very literal understanding of Scripture and of what Jesus says. And this yeah. is where, um, you know, I, I believe, you know, as a scholar who's taught the Bible for, for years and years, <laughs> that I have now come into a community that perhaps, well, I will say this, uh, understands Scripture better than our yeah. Protest Protestant brethren. Well, yeah. yeah, if you had a room with 10 scripture scholars, and yeah. one was Catholic and then Presbyterian, Methodist, yeah. and yeah. Baptist. And right. The problem is not the scriptures, because all, if they're Orthodox believers, right. take the scriptures as infallible. Right, right. The difference are the traditions. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Because there's no Christian in the world that's truly sola scriptura. Right. I mean, you had traditions. You didn't want to call <laughs> it that. Absolutely, no. Right. <laughs> and by the way, I had an icon of John Calvin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there, you know uh, and, and that's where, you know, with my, my Presbyterian friends, I, I needle them a little bit because, well, you know, we don't have icons. Well, I see John Calvin. On John the, Calvin or John Knox. <laughs> or John yeah, Knox or Luther yeah. or what have you. Yeah. Right. But yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it has to do with, you know, the hermeneutics and how they approach the scripture and they choose to do it. But, I, you know, I, I, in, in teaching the Reformation, I always had a little bit of a struggle with the idea that, you know, we're going we're gonna to knock off Hebrews, we're going to knock off James, yeah. we're going to knock off, you know, the Petrine letters. Those are scripture too, passed down to us. And even if, even if Protestants, we don't like them, we have to deal with them. And that is where, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've also told my students, look at, you know, St. Paul wasn't the only apostle. And we need to really deal with all of sacred script. I, it's funny, just the last program I did, I used the same scripture. And see, the problem, it seems to me, yeah. with this misunderstanding of Sola Scriptura, which you've lived, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it isn't the Sola Scriptura. When we were at Gordon Conwell, it wasn't Sola, it's just that we all had different traditions. Right. So the danger is that there are aspects of the gospel that are easy, and there are aspects that aren't. That are difficult, right? So what do we do with the difficult parts? And the different traditions deal with them differently. Right. So, for example, one scripture that jumps, this is Jesus saying this. He says, so therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has mm -hmm. cannot be my disciple. Right. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. It is. It so is. what do our traditions do 
with that. Yeah. I don't remember that being mentioned much in my Calvinist tradition. Right? Absolutely. You know, one one thing that really struck me um, several years ago was listening to a Reformed theologian talk about Jesus' baptism. And when John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this man said, John was wrong. Jesus is not taking away the sins of the world. He's covering the sins. And I thought to myself, you're saying that John the Baptist is wrong. That, that, that was, that's a problem for me. <laughs> and, and then I begin to ask, what else was John the Baptist wrong about? And, you know, this, is, this, was a, this was a very, very interesting moment when I began to really think, there's, there's something going on here. And, and Scripture does teach that our sanctification is a real sanctification. It's not just the covering. Yeah. It is a, a reformation of the person. Yep. And uh, this is yep. what Christ is doing in us and through us and with us. Yeah, that's... That's a fascinating experience because yeah. that would have been a solo scriptura guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what happened was his solo scriptura, from that came their doctrines, mm -hmm. and then their doctrines turned around to redo scripture. Right. It's right. like Luther wanting to get rid of, of James. Uh, James. Yeah. Right. Because his theology mm -hmm. outweighed right. James. Yeah. And James and Paul were both apostles. Right. The Gospels say a lot of things that really make us struggle with this idea of by faith alone. Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Jesus at the, at, you know, talks about the judgment. It's what you have done yeah. that's going to be judged. James says, you know, the demons believe, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of things really fell into place for me. And my, my, I was telling you a little while ago, my favorite scripture verse in, in the Gospels is Matthew 28, 17. All right. Uh, and and I, I encourage our listeners to, to look this up. Uh, <laughs> Matthew 28, 17. Um, they worshiped him, but some doubted. It's at the Great Commission. They're yeah. worshiping him, but some doubt. And he still says, go. He doesn't say, okay, let's go over this all over again. He did that at Emmaus. He did that other places. But at this point, he says, go into all the world preach the gospel, preach everything that I have taught you, baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is, this is the church. Yeah. This is the history of the church. Well, it gets to that conundrum between God's sovereignty and our freedom. Right. And we know that there are Christian traditions that are divided from one another with their different opinions of that. Yeah. But the Catholic Church always says that faith is a free choice. Yeah. We have grace that awakens right. us, changes our right. heart and mind and everything, but right. in the end, God never forces anyone. So those, some believed and some doubted, Yeah, yeah. that's the church. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. I, uh, I also have a new understanding, honestly, of, of the opposition of, of the satanic world. Mm. Satan and all of his angels were in heaven. They were there. They were before God. As James tells us, they believe hmm. and still do, right? And yet chose against that. You know, you hear people say, well, if I were in heaven and if I were before God, certainly I'd believe, you know, if God would just show up to me, you know, he'd send me an email or a letter or something, sure, I'm going to believe, yeah. right? But there were those who were in heaven who rejected that. There were those who were in paradise yeah. <laughs> who yeah. ate the apple and and rejected that, right? So we have that will. We have that ability yeah. to choose. And he in his divine economy, uh, salvation history, has given us yeah. uh, that ability to love him yeah, or not. Boy, we open up so many things we could talk about. I know. Yeah, I'm sorry. But I mean, I'm... no, no, no. I mean, that's, that's fascinating because to me, it, you know, so often when, when people describe Scripture and they try and you know, uh, give the plan of Scripture, and yeah. it can become very complicated, yeah. as, as yeah. you and I go into the same oh, seminary yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But there's really something very simple, thread that runs from Adam all the way through to Revelation, yeah. and it's something called the two ways. Yeah, right. It's either me 
or not. Or not. Yeah. That's it. Simply. Right. Simply. Right. Yeah. And you have the freedom. Right. And at different points in history, God gave more information, gave grace, but yeah. always. Right. It was you choose. Right. It's up to you to choose. And that's the amazingness yeah. of God's steadfast mm -hmm. love is mm -hmm. that he loves us so much, but he's still in the end, whoever would believe. Right. It's it's the freedom of yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But, so, yeah. We'll just pause there. Okay, right. Uh, our guest is Dr. Kenneth Calvert, and it's a great privilege uh, to have him here. We're going to take a break, come back in a moment. And before we break, I just want to remind you, if you would, go to chnetwork.org. That's the website for the Coming Home Network International, where if you go there, you can find all kinds of resources, conversion stories, uh, other videos, um, other podcasts and stuff to help you along your journey. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Dr. Kenneth Calvert. And uh, we've got you into the church, so now yes. we can sit back, relax, and talk <laughs> right. about a number of topics. But yeah. one, one pending question that I wanted to ask earlier was, uh, you've got a very uh, uh, well-read, fallen apart, duct-taped book here. Yeah. That is that book on, which my guess is a, a lot of our audience had never, never read. read, even heard of. Right. St. Athanasius. But, but my question is, yeah. that's not a normal reading thing right. at Gordon-Conwell. <laughs> right. Evangelicals not... aren't reading those early right. church fathers. Yeah, you know, how dare they? So yeah, how did that happen? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I was going through the process of becoming a pastor at Gordon, through Gordon-Conwell, and it, it became very clear that I was not called into the pulpit ministry, right, in the pastorate. <laughs> and I was talking to one of my, my professors, uh, old history professor at Gordon-Conwell, Nigel Kerr, yeah. wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, faithful man. Yeah. We were sitting there and I was in kind of this moment of, of uh, crisis. And he said, you know, Ken, all you ever talk about is the early church. You should do that. And the light came on and uh, it's like, <laughs> yes, I should. And it, it meant I had to jump into more Greek and more Latin and Coptic and all kinds of things. But, you know, that's okay. And uh, took, took advantage of a lot of the universities around the Boston area, Harvard and Boston College, yeah. et cetera. It, just wonderful, wonderful place to be a scholar. And um, it's at that point that I really was, I think, hooked, mm -hmm. uh, looking into the fathers and really diving into that world. Um, this particular translation by Sister Penelope Lawson um, was done in the 1950s, and she knew Lewis, C.S. Lewis. Oh, that's right. That's got the introduction by C.S. Lewis. A great introduction, yeah. and everyone should read that introduction yeah, yeah, yeah. on reading old books. Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful introduction. So it's got some Lewis in there. It's got some early fathers. That's what got me, you know, as an evangelical. Uh, and so um, began to really uh, pursue those studies and had a chance to study a little bit at Oxford uh, and Bristol universities, and then took a degree from Harvard. And, um, you know, throughout all of that, deeper and deeper into uh, the study. I ended up actually studying with a man named Edwin Yamauchi at Miami of Ohio. Mm -hmm. 17 languages, this guy, and, and, and a brilliant <laughs> expert in the early church, uh, early heresies like Gnosticism. And it was just more and more just drawn into this world of the fathers and of patristics and understanding the foundations of the church and who we are as Christians and ultimately who we are as Catholics. Right. Um, at the time, I, I, I was Episcopalian and had been Episcopalian for quite a time. While I was in England, I, I, I worked for the Church of England. But um, when, uh, honestly, when the Episcopal Church began to come off the rails a little bit, um, a lot of bit, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stay. And so Beth and I wandered a little bit. Um, we actually ended up being Baptists for a couple of years. So that was a, but then we ended up in the, in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church in okay. Hillsdale. Yeah. Um, and there again, a high view of, of the meal, right. um, a sense of, uh, of liturgical worship, um, all very good, but still not, not where we could stay. Um, yeah, there were some of the Missouri Synod Lutherans that were really leaning. Yeah. 
Yeah. Was it was it peep corn? Was that a yes. whole group of folk that yeah. were really? Yeah, and a number a number of of people have come into the church out of the Missouri, Missouri Synod, and um, you know again yeah. not that I would turn my back upon my friends and brethren in the Missouri Synod Church, but really I think Joel, my my oldest son, um, he began to really talk about how this wasn't enough. Hmm. Uh, Beth, uh, you know my dear wife Beth. Um, also, you know, this just really isn't enough. That's right. You mentioned that your son came in first. Yes, that's the right. Beginning of the program. Yeah, yeah. My so, son, and then my daughter, and Beth. And yeah. So he, uh, his journey was separate from yours. Yes. And so, and so, what's what's wonderful about this family history is that my children didn't come into the church honestly out of rebellion against their father and against the Lutheran church. There was no sense of a rebelliousness. They were seeking the truth, and hmm. that, Marcus, that I think really struck me most powerfully. Hmm. Again, when my son at the Easter vigil was coming into the church, and I'm standing there thinking, "Why am I not doing this?" And then I see my daughter and and Beth, and um, you know, they they are, they're doing this out of a genuine sense of love for Jesus. And our youngest son, Ian, who came in, you know, who needed a little bit more convincing and uh, was just surrounded by some wonderful people, including one of his running coaches, uh, you know, really helped to bring him in as well. Hmm. And so this was, this was uh, like I said, our deacon called it the Calvert invasion. You know, it, 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 was a, it was a thing where there wasn't a lot of battles fighting and, and arguing over this, although with Beth and, and I, 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 was, I was still that Calvinist for a while, kind of fighting the fight, but um, couldn't, couldn't hold that position for long. And uh, You yeah. know, in our work here in the Coming Home Network, we're for 23 years, well, no, how long has it been? 27 years we've yeah. been standing beside non-Catholic clergy and laity or somewhere on this journey. I mean, right. We don't begin this work by going out trying to convince them. They right. come to us saying, yeah. We've discovered this stuff, now what do we do? And the issue often comes down to the mandate. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? After you've got all the data, you've seen all the people make the journey, right. and you've resisted and all that, there comes down to, do I have to? Right, right. I mean, what, what was it in the end that convinced your heart that this is no longer something that I can stay away from. Yeah. I think, again, in the Easter vigil, both for my son and for my daughter, um, there's a phrase, and I know I'm going to get it wrong, um, oh, happy fault, right? Mm -hmm. And I had never thought of the fall that way. And what, what does that mean? It means that Humanity has fallen, which is a great tragedy, but it also is the unfolding of God's great salvation history and the incarnation yeah. being the most important moment in that. And I, I uh, again, yeah. emotionally, I was overwhelmed. And then at the Church of the Annunciation, you know, just all of these things, just breaking down all the walls. Um, in addition to my loving, loving family who were all praying for me, and my wife, I think, saying lots of uh, rosaries for me, uh, you know, all of that just broke through. And I've heard so many converts, and I think this is true for me too, talk about this as a discovery of the fullness of faith. It's not that I didn't have a faith in Christ. It's not that I wasn't a Christian, but I have now come into the fullness of faith. And um, I, uh, we, we go to Mass as often as we can, not to, to show off or to score points or anything like that. But, you know, Marcus, it is, is something I desire. It's something Beth desires. And it is, it is that, that fullness of faith that um, is, is so, so very, very important there. For yeah. years, I've done a radio and a podcast program called Verses I Never Saw. Mm. And what I always meant by that was... I, I, I could have looked at that verse a thousand times. <laughs> right. You know what I'm yeah, talking I about? Yeah, I do know what you we mean. Know what, yeah. We see it and we yeah. read it. I can yeah. memorize it. I can yeah. exegete it. I can. <laughs> but all of a sudden, where'd that come from? And right. one of the verses that is like the one you're talking about. Yeah. And that is fully seeing what he meant when it says, 
while we were yet sinners. Yeah, right. He died for us. Right. While we were yet, yet sinners. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you're saying. The incarnation, mm -hmm. while we were yet sinners. Right. He didn't do it because we were so good. No, no. And, and you know, this, this, this faith, if, if we talk it from a sociological perspective, this religion, this couldn't have been invented by human minds. This could only have been revealed. I, you know, and, and other scholars are going to say, oh, that guy, you know. Well, but, there's a know, whole but, group of scholars that say, you know, all this was made up in the, like the second yeah, century. Yeah, Rome. right. Oh, exactly. And I studied with those guys at Harvard, by the way. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, the, 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 the long and the short of it is that um, this is just such a powerful and remarkable truth that by God's grace, he has given this to us. And, you know, I, and, and I believe uh, fully that within the Catholic Church, there is a full understanding because of the magisterium, thousands of years of studying this and being able to come, you know, to terms with all kinds of ideas. So much of what we're talking about, the incarnation itself is endless. You can never stop thinking about it, right? There's so many aspects to it. But the magisterium has brought together, you know, a body of faith uh, in the catechism that I think is... is is the fullness of the Christian faith. Yeah, and that, that fullness, which the church claims subsists in this church, which yeah, means it right. continues, it remains all right. these, it's, it's there. It may be covered with a bunch of carbuncles, right. which are your name and my name. Right. You know, we're, we're the car, but there it is. And the beauty is with all those traditions sitting at yeah. the table, yeah. they believe in Christ, they believe in the infallible scripture. Yeah. Here is the tradition that makes sure that we're not cutting out pieces of the gospel. Right. You just because they're hard. Right, right. You've got to pay attention to all of it, right? And, and, and you know, um, the, the miracle of this is that in spite of all of our carbuncles, in spite of the, the Ken Calverts and, and the Marcus Grodis, that this gospel is still being preached yeah. and is still being spread, and the church continues, in spite of all of the insanity, it continues to flourish why it's because he's present in it mm -hmm. and you know he's there um one thing that gordon conwell taught me and one thing i love <laughs> about my own college at hillsdale is taking seriously the ancient writings mm -hmm. taking seriously history taking seriously philosophy and theology even if it's bad philosophy still giving it a hearing and thinking about it, you know, yeah. even if it's bad theology, you know, thinking about it. And all of that is was part of my life at Gordon-Conwell. I thank Gordon-Conwell for the languages, the history, the context, all of the things they taught me to think about when looking at scripture and history. I thank my own college for having that. I love being at this college. And, and you know, I'm not trying to make this a, an advertisement for my college, but honest, honestly, we've had a, a number of students become Catholic yeah. at the college. And why? And a couple of professors as well. Why? It's because of taking seriously all of these things. Um, well, I was going to say nothing about Hillsdale. I've never had the privilege of actually being there. I've always wanted to come go. on up. I know. But... It's not just whether some of them became Catholic, but I think the environment brings people to a deeper walk with Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is, it is a remarkable little Christian yeah. college, and uh, it has been able to maintain a civil and happy conversation among all these Christians of different perspectives. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, for 16 years, I was the head of school for our little K through 12 school, Hillsdale mm -hmm. Academy. And by the way, this is where all my children went to school as well. So who, who can I blame for my children becoming Catholic? You know, the Holy Spirit, to be sure. But also their teachers at Hillsdale Academy, some of whom yeah. are Catholic, some of whom are not. But all of them taught seriously yeah. the great books, the great ideas, the sciences and mathematics, understanding God's creation in a way, and, and, and understand not from necessarily a creationist point of view, but from a point of view in which you really come to love science and mathematics in all of its glory and how God has uh, really brought order into his universe, into yeah, his creation. I, I want to make a, just a clarification there for some viewers that 
maybe didn't catch the significance of denying creationist views. Yeah. That's a capital C particular yeah. view right. that that's pretty negative about science. Right, right, but right. But there are many there are many there are many who are within, you know, who understand creationism and understand it within yeah. its proper, you know, purview. He, the God's a creator, like he I said. You can't understand yeah. any science yeah. without yeah. recognizing right. exactly. that it came and from God. Thank you for that clarification. And you know, but this is this is what my children were brought up with. And um one of my great concerns um, as I come out, come into the Catholic world, is to see a return of greater and better catechesis yeah. in the church, in Catholic schools, um, throughout the church. I, I, I think, you know, again, going back to the Reformation and teaching the Reformation myself, one thing that I noticed was one, one thing that the, the Reformation, what caused the Reformation was an ignorance of what the church taught yeah. was an ignorance of Catholicism. And I think that we're kind of in a similar uh, you know, atmosphere today where we really need to return to a, a genuine catechesis, and not only of our children, but of anyone who comes into RCIA or wants to come into the church. And, and there are a number of groups around the country and around the world who are doing a good job. You know, yeah. ED, EWTN has been part of this, of yeah. really helping to catechize the Cate church. Catechesis yeah. and yeah. praxis, yeah. really living. Yeah. And that's tough in, in our crazy day that we're living, but it helping is. one another learn how to live it out. Yeah. We have an email from Michigan, Beverly okay. from Michigan. So yeah. I'm a reformed Christian. Yeah. So I know what part of Michigan she's on, okay. Uh, who has recently <laughs> begun reading more about church history on account of wanting to know more about what happened after Christ mm -hmm. and before the Reformation. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why Catholics seem to think that the early church had the same beliefs and practices that Catholics have today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, uh, yeah, there has been some transition. There has been some change. Um, the church has to meet culture where it's at. And often it does it successfully. Often it does it unsuccessfully, right? All through the church, history of the church, the church has had to deal with the culture in which it's located. Um, and very often it's successful, and sometimes it's not successful. Some of our heresies have emerged out of that desire to be like the world around us, yeah. right? And so this is this is part of, of the history of the church. What we would have to acknowledge, though, is, for instance, John Calvin and Martin Luther both affirmed most of the essentials of those eight ecumenical councils before the Reformation. Mm -hmm. One thing we often forget as Protestants is that Calvin and Luther were not about tossing everything. In fact, there are some suggestions, I wouldn't say it's clear, but in some suggestions that Calvin makes, you know, in, in, in his commentaries on the Gospels, that he might have acknowledged that Mary was not only virgin, but per perpetually virgin, right? Um, and so, you know, you have to think about that. You also have to understand that quite often Protestants made more of some things that Calvin and Luther said than what Calvin and Luther Actually, yeah, the said. second generation, yeah, right. third generation right. Lutherans were more right. anti-Catholic yeah. than Luther was. You know, you know, it's often it's often said that Saint Augustine was the father of the Reformation, right? <laughs> and B.B. Um, Warfield and some other you know Protestants and Calvinist uh, theologians have dealt with that issue, that question. Um, and one has to understand that Cal that you know Augustine was very much a father who helped to shape Western yeah. Latin Catholicism help to shape the church. You know, what is it about him that Calvin and Luther liked? What is it about him that they rejected? And one has to get after that. And of course, Augustine himself is building upon those who came before him. But I think um, most importantly, I, 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 again, I point back to people like Athanasius of Alexandria. If Athanasius had not fought the good fight, contra mundum, as we say, against mm. the world, he was, he was exiled five times during his Episcopal yeah. A lot of time, um, we would not have benefited from his insistence on the language of how we understand the Father and Son, right? Because Constantine's sons were in no mind to support the Nicene Creed. 
And when you look at Calvinists or Lutherans or any Protestant today and you ask them, how would you define the relationship between the Father and the Son, they might start with the Gospel of John, but then they immediately move into the creedal language. And where does that creedal language come from? It comes from tradition, right? And, the, and, and many more examples we could give, yeah. Yeah, the, one of the reasons the Catholic Church does not say that the writings of Augustine or Cyprian or even Athanasius are infallible right. is because they were they're faithful not. men, but right. they're not. Because one of the dangers in those early days of the church was um, radical hermeneutics that were when push comes to shove, they sometimes go a step too far. Right. So you have two groups fighting out over this doctrine. Right. In the end, they have to end up over here. Right. And over right. here, right. almost stressing it too far. Right. And uh, the kernel of what they're saying is true, but what they ended up saying is a bit too oh, far. Yeah, right, right. And, and there you have um, the need to be very careful over hundreds of years, thousands of years now, of really looking at these arguments. And that's why, you know, C.S. Lewis's essay on reading old books, he says this very thing. He says an old book is always written within a context, right? Yeah. Yeah. So is a new book. <laughs> and so one has to be careful, not only about the context of that old book, but also it teaches us to be careful about the context of the new ideas. Yeah. And this is where, you know, the Catholic Church has to be careful. All Christians have to be careful with modernity and how it impacts us. Yeah. Let's take another email. Yeah. Okay. Ella from Washington. Um, what would you say are a few of the more popular historical misunderstandings people have about the early church? Right. How can everyday <clears throat> Catholics better understand church history about studying it for years, without studying it for years in college? Right, yeah. I think two things. One, um, and this is probably more of a Protestant answer, if you believe that the early church began day one with a complete New Testament, it's wrong. Uh, you know, it takes 300 years for the church to agree upon that. Yeah. And so you have to understand that there's apostolic authority, and that apostolic authority is in the bishops, etc. Okay, which gets me to my second point, and that's with for the Catholic side and for St. Peter. If you want to believe that there is a unified and happy Catholic church at Rome, from day one, you're going to be, you're also going to be a little bit disappointed. But you do have this, you know, the, the, the apostolic succession of popes at Rome who themselves are arguing, fighting through, bringing together all of the various ideas that are in Scripture and the apostolic teaching that's coming to them and being able and, and starting to formulate all of this. Now, were all the essential doctrines there? Of course they were. You know, because Jesus yeah. taught Peter all of those. We find this in the Gospel of Mark, that those were taught. But there are so many other things, the ramifications of those beliefs, um, very, very much a part of this. So if, if somebody, a Catholic, were to say, well, you know, in the early church you had trouble with this, yes, we did. But you know what? It, it, it was ironed out. Yeah, that, yeah. that wonderful struggle that Newman went through right. in the mid-19th century right. with Essentially, as an Anglican, he's looking back to the early church, mm -hmm. and the question is, well, which church today is the most faithful continuity right. of that? Right. The Orthodox, yeah. or the Anglican, or the Catholic? Because right. in the mid-19th century, everything in the early church could have been all three. Right, right, right. But, but, but there were developments. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. do you understand the changes? And that's right. what his whole development idea. Right. And that's was. where I would argue the fullness of faith. You know, are the Orthodox not Christian? No. You know, are the Protestants not Christian? No, they're not. I mean, they are Christian yeah. brothers. But where is the fullness of faith that has been gathered down through these millennia? It's in the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, for Newman, part of the issue was the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Right. right. As a continuity. Yeah. Right. That not only goes back early church, but it's what yeah. connects us to Judah in the Old Testament. Right, exactly. And, 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 and does that mean that the, the Bishop of Rome was going to be a perfect guy? No. You know, and, and this is something I well, have... Well, they were all perfect throughout history, right? If you lose... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, Peter himself, you know, was just, you They're know. Pretty nasty guy. Yeah, and you, you, yeah. so you look at the whole history of these. Yeah. These are men and fallen men. and Who have know. grace, but they have freedom yes, to respond to it. Yes, yes. It, and like any Christian people. leadership, you know, is, is going to be, you know, but, but they have that apostolic authority that's been passed down. And what is it there to teach? It's, it's the teachings of Jesus and the apostolic teachings. And that's what they do. Ken. It's great to have you on Marcus, the program. Marcus, thank you so Dr. much. Dr. Calvert. Dr. Yep. Calvert, what a great privilege. We ran out of time. It's been an That's honor. It's a shame, professor yep. of ancient history at Hillsdale. And uh, what a great privilege to have you here. Thank, thank you, you for your journey and, and for what you continue to do. And thank you for what you do. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, I just stay out of the way. Yep. Yep. That's the goal. So, uh, But thanks again. And all of you, thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I, I pray that uh, Ken's journey as well as his commitment to the intellectual understanding of our history and how the Holy Spirit has worked all through to protect scripture as well as the, the, the church so it remains the, the witness to the fullness that that's been encouragement to you if you haven't to examine this great church. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you again next week.